Dr. Sharice Jones Branch, a native of Charleston, South Carolina, is professor of history and director of the A State Digital Press at Arkansas State University Jonesboro, where she teaches courses in U.S., women's, civil rights, rural African American history, and heritage studies. Dr. Jones Branch received her bachelor's and master's degrees from the College of Charleston, South Carolina, and a doctorate in history from the Ohio State University, Columbus. She has been teaching at Arkansas State University since 2003. Dr. Jones Branch is the author of numerous articles on women's civil rights activism. In 2014, she published Crossing the Line, Women and Interracial Activism in South Carolina during, during and after World War II with the University Press of Florida and is the co-editor of the forthcoming Arkansas Women, Their Lives and Times, which will be published by the University of Georgia Press. She is also working on a second monograph, Better Living by Their Own Bootstraps, Rural Black Women's Activism in Arkansas, which is under contract with the University of Arkansas Press. I present to you Dr. Sharice Jones Branch. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I had my husband get up at six o'clock in the morning to drive me to Little Rock. He was not thrilled, but he's a good husband. Um, I just want to tell you just a few things that I've discovered about African American women um, in the Arkansas Republican Party. This actually started as uh, part of a, the larger project that I'm working on, on uh, rural black women in Arkansas. And I started doing some research on one of the women uh, whom I've written more extensively about, and I realized that, oh, she's a Republican. And so, you know, I had questions about what that meant in the context of 1960s Arkansas. I did some digging around, and I Ran, ran across some other things that um, I will share with you today. Um, and so I'll begin. Uh, it's been generally accepted that African Americans wholly embraced the Democratic Party by 1970. However, this is not entirely the case in Arkansas. African Americans were members of the Arkansas Republican Party in the 1960s and the 1970s. And in particular, black women embraced and often became prominent Republican Party members. Uh, one of the books that I referred to as I was thinking about all of this was written by Harvard University scholar Leah Wright Rigueur, and this was published in 2016 by the uh, Princeton University Press. Um, and what she argues in here is that, quote, it wasn't until the 1960s that despite being the least likely of any racial demographic to vote for the Republican Party, black women increasingly played a public role, an important public role, um, in party affairs. And what I discovered was that this was certainly the case in um, among African American women in Arkansas. Um, I also think this study and all the other studies on African American women in, in Arkansas that I'm doing are, are so important because we just don't know enough about what black women are doing in this state. And as I tell my students, African American history does not just mean black men. And women's history does not just mean white women. Um, and these are the two, th this group of people tends to get lost in any of those uh, kinds, of, kinds of studies. So it's, it's important for me to talk about this. Um, black women turned to the Republican Party in Arkansas largely because they could not access the state Democratic Party. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples of some individuals here, some of whom have had long histories in Arkansas politics and uh, activism. And one of these individuals, if you can see this here, and this first name might be familiar to some of you, but one of the examples I want to share with you here is uh, Benoit, Mississippi native, and Gould, Arkansas resident, Carrie L. Dilworth. Um, and just a couple of things about her in the 1970s in the Republican Party, uh, that she was chairperson of the Lincoln County Voters Education Project, and she also ran for, uh, for state representative against a Democratic incumbent, uh, Star City's Jimmy McKissick. Now, activism is not new to Ms. Dilworth. She had been an activist at least since the 1930s. In fact, she was um, a member of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, which was founded in uh, Tyronza, Arkansas in 1934. She was on its uh, 
executive council, and she was also well known as one of his best organizers. Um, also during the 1960s, during the civil rights movement, she worked with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to organize the Gould Citizens for uh, Gould Citizens for Progress Committee, or the GCPC, and she also later ran unsuccessfully uh, to become the town's mayor. Um, another individual that I want to share with you is in the corner there, Caroline Jett, and she lived down in Chico County, Arkansas, and she was a cafe owner. Um, also in 1970, she ran for the state senate for the Republican Party. She too lost, in fact, she lost 253 points to 53 points to a gentleman named John Scott Sr. And, you know, again, what's so exciting about this is that much of this information has been digitized. So I can spend hours and hours and hours on my computer uh, looking at the Arkansas Gazette, looking at the Hope Star, looking at all kinds of newspapers and never have to leave my office. And so what I discovered here, I just do random searches just to see what pops up, right? And so what I found was this, and it's a much larger article about these races and who won and who lost, but you see down there, District 44 Republican primary. So you've got Mrs. Caroline Jett, right? She only has 53 points to John Scott Jr.'s 253 points. And these things are all over the newspapers. Um, so I've been, I've been able to gather a lot of my information just by reading these newspapers. Um, also, younger black women are influenced by Republican Party politics. So here's one example. Um, this is Geneve Smith. She's from Lone Oak County. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Okay, I, I've messed up quite a few Arkansas words in my time. Um, she was elected secretary of the Lone Oak County chapter of the Young Republicans of Arkansas in 1971. And some of these younger black women even take their politics into pageantry. So this is a picture of Marion Kelly, and this is in 1971. Um, Marilyn Kelly was a graduate of Arkansas am and N. She was from Poplar Grove, Arkansas, in Phillips County. And when she competed in the first Miss Black Arkansas pageant, and I really would like to know more about that. If you have any information, please let me know. But when she competes in this pageant, as you can see here, or maybe you can't see here, she competes as Miss Black Young Republican. And she also competed in 1969 um, in the Miss Arkansas World Pageant. So you've got these younger women who are competing in pageants and taking their political uh, stands with them. And by the way, when she competes in his, this pageant, her platform was, quote, the importance of youth becoming more involved in politics, end quote. One of the other things that I discovered was that Republican Party uh, uh, members often reached out to African Americans. Uh, they embraced them, welcomed them into the party. They were interested in many of their concerns. Um, and they were invested in, 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 in integrating them into the party in a way that hadn't been done since Reconstruction. And so when New Yorker, and I've jumped ahead a little, there's another image there of, um, Marilyn Kelly, so you see there, she was a contestant in the 1969 Miss Arkansas World Pageant. Um, and by the way, all of these things are in the Arkansas Outlook, which was the, the newspaper for the Arkansas Republican Party. I just happened to be in their, their house at, the, at Arkansas State University. I just happened to be in the archives looking for something completely different. I started thumbing through all of this stuff and these black women started popping up. So I decided to make it work. Um, anyway, when New Yorker, and Republican Winthrop Rockefeller ran for governor in 1966, part of what helped him was the organizing skills of African-American women. Um, and one of these people that I'm going to mention to you here who, um, had, who had these incredible canvassing and organizing skills was a Marvel, Arkansas native by the name of Annie Zachary Pike. And um, I'll show you a picture of her in just a second. Um, Ms. Pike is still alive. She's 85 years young. In fact, she just called me yesterday about something, so we talk fairly often. So she's still living in Marvel. And when I talked to her, she clearly identified herself as a Rockefeller Republican. She was adamant about that. So lest there be any confusion about where she is politically, she made that abundantly clear to me. Um, and I also say this or, or talk about her to stress the importance of making a concerted effort to find these people. Many of them are still around. 
right? So, you know, ask or ask someone who might know something and that leads you to whatever it is you might be looking for. But I interviewed her in July of 2016. I drove down to Marble, Arkansas. I had never been down there before. Um, and she welcomed me like I was a long lost relative. And then she proceeded to feed me. I know you'll find this interesting. She proceeded to feed me, wait for it, chicken salad, soup, chicken and dumplings, and steak, and orange jello with Cool Whip. And all of that before we began our conversation. Um, and after we ate, she said, well, you know, Dr. Branch, is there anything else you need? And I said, Miss Annie, I need a nap. Um, <laughs> because that's way more food than I usually um, consume. Just a little bit about Miss Annie. So she was born in Marble, Arkansas in 1931. Um, she married a man in 1951 whom I believe was about 30 to 40 years older than her, Mr. Cleave. Um, he's no longer around, just in case you were wondering. Um, and they owned and farmed 2,000 acres of land and they had sharecroppers working for them. These are the stories that we don't hear about uh, people in the rural, in rural Arkansas. Anyway, so Ms. Annie campaigned on Rockefeller's behalf, and she even served as his local Republican Party coordinator. And so when Rockefeller was elected Arkansas's first Republican governor since Reconstruction in 1967, he won with 80% of black Arkansans' votes. And because of what Ms. Zach, Ms. Annie did for him, he named her to the Arkansas Welfare Board. Um, and I do believe that this was probably one of the first times an African American had been appointed to a board by an Arkansas governor, um, probably since Reconstruction. Anyway, Miss Annie's, and, uh, when I, and I'll get to this in just a second, Miss Annie's prominence within the Arkansas Republican Party led to other national and local and national appointments. In 1970, she was appointed to the Arkansas Economic Development Advocacy Advisory Council, the USDA Citizens Advisory Committee on Civil Rights, the Arkansas Farmers Home Administration Advisory Committee, and she and another rural black woman by the, woman by the name of Willa Howard from Mariana and Lee County were the only two black women members of the Arkansas delegation at the Republican National Convention in Miami, Florida in 1972. So what I have here again from the Arkansas Outlook is a picture of the delegates and the alternates. Um, and this is Willa Howard. And over there in the corner is Mrs. Annie Zachary. And at that time, she was Miss Annie Zachary. She didn't remarry until about 1973. And they didn't just go to this conference, by the way. Ms. Zachary was also the co-chairperson of the platform uh, subcommittee at the convention. So she's not just sitting there. She has an active role in all of this. And I want to tell you some more about her role in all of this. While she was in Miami, Ms. Annie met with the National Federation of Republican Women, um, which was founded in 1939. And at this meeting, who was there? Uh, First Lady Pat Nixon, her daughters, and Judy Agnew, the wife of Vice President Spiro Agnew. So the members of this organization discussed the difficulties of women running for political office, and many of them had earned their place among the Republican elite in their states through their connections to their husbands or their fathers. But Ms. Annie stood out from them in this respect. She had earned her stripes through her own efforts and her reputation as a farmer and a Republican Party mover. And she also said that she had become a Republican simply because, quote, they asked me, end quote, and that she had been involved in politics for eight years. And she praised the Arkansas Republican Party for getting more African Americans involved in politics and for motivating her to, quote, go further and seek ways to make America a better place to live, end quote. And she offered the following perspective about being a Southern black woman Republican running for political office. And she says, I, and this is a quote again, I have definitely been a guinea pig in this race. But to make progress, someone has to make great sacrifices. I feel that it is time for women to realize this, to come forward and to get involved in the affairs of our country. Ms. Annie additionally said that she wanted to sound the alarm for American women to quote, wake up, get up, and get to work. And then you can say and feel that as a result of your efforts, what seem an impossible dream can be made a reality, end quote. Later in 1972, 
And here's a picture of Miss Annie, and this is Mrs. Joan Crawford um, from Missouri. So she was the vice chairman of the Missouri GOP, right? Um, and this is in Jet Magazine, by the way, 1972 Jet Magazine. Later in 1972, Miss Annie became the first African American to file and run successfully for an elected position in the 20th century, in 20th century Arkansas. She represented, and there she is down there in the corner, she represented District 34, which included predominantly African American Lee and Phillips counties. And Miss Annie, running on a polls, sought to unseat the incumbent, Democrat Joe Lee Anderson of Helena, which of course is also in Phillips County. Now she lost by 1,250. 59 votes. And you can see there are the numbers, right? She lost by 1,259 votes, having obtained 6,711 votes from Phillips and Lee County in comparison to Anderson's 7,970 votes. But for Miss Annie, fewer votes did not represent a loss because she had demonstrated that black and white Arkansans would vote for a qualified candidate. And this is what she had to say about that. The tally sheet shows that I lost, but I know I didn't. I won in practically every box in the county, and the support that I got from both races was just tremendous. At the polls, I didn't win, but deep down in my heart, I still feel that I was a winner." End quote. That same year, Anderson, who had been a state senator since 1969, was indicted on three counts of filing false income tax returns when he underestimated his taxable income for 1965, 1966, and 1967. And he resigned from the Arkansas State Senate in 1973. Now, Ms. Annie's affiliation with the Republican Party didn't end after she lost that election. Um, indeed, in 1973, she was elected Vice President of the Arkansas Republican Minority Republican Organization, or AMRO, whose goal it was to bring more African Americans into the Republican Party. She also continued to represent the interests of African Americans in Arkansas's 4th Congressional District on the Republican State Committee, and in 1974, um, she served on, the Arkans on Arkansas's GOP e Executive Committee. Other black women also assumed positions in local Republican women's clubs and committees and ran for offices, um, elected offices around the state in the late 1960s and 1970s. This is just one example. This is Miss um, Minnie Pearl Ross from North Little Rock. And in 1968, she became the first African American elected to the Republican State Committee. She was also a member of the Pulaski County Republican Committee in 1973. She ran for the North Little Rock School Board. Um, here's another example, the black woman on, I guess that's what, your, well that would be your left. In 1973, this is Mrs. Ray Joshua, she was the first vice president of the North Little Rock Republican Women's Club. All right in our backyard, right? And lastly, down in Crittenden County, Arkansas, this is Mrs. Henry Graham. She was an election official in all the elections held in the county since 1966. And of course, accessing voting was an important civil rights issue. So these women are civil rights activists. In 1969, Graham co-coordinated the Crittenden County Archer Voter, Edu uh, Voter Education Program. In 1970, she managed Winthrop Rockefeller's West Memphis Minority Headquarters. And in 1972, she directed the combined GOP and re-elect the president office. Deeply involved in Republican politics. Uh, in 1974, Graham was also a Crittenden County Republican Committee member, a delegate to the past four GOP state conventions, and the Crittenden County AMRO chair, uh, chairperson. So all of this to say that African Americans and African American women in particular eagerly embraced the Arkansas GOP in the 1960s and the 1970s because it provided them with a level of political engagement and opportunities to affect change, which they believe were denied them by the state Democratic Party. It is likely that after Governor Winthrop Rockefeller's death in 1973, that they found the Republican Party's increasingly conservative rhetoric distasteful and instead began to embrace the Democratic Party. And what I found as I was looking through the Arkansas outlook was that after about 1973, 1974, and I looked as far up as I could go probably until about 1979, I didn't see any more evidence of 
black people, period, certainly not black women, um, in the newspaper, which strongly suggests to me that they, there may have been, um, they, they may have moved on and affiliated with the Democratic Party. Um, Anyway, yet for a time, the Arkansas Republican Party's progressive politics appealed to black women who understood them as the greatest hope for the state's African Americans. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Dr. Graves said he had lots of questions, so let's have it. <laughs> Go ahead, let's do it. <laughs> I can't hear you. Hi, um, well, I, 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 just one comment first, just to reinforce what you said. We were discussing this, of course, mm -hmm. uh, over lunch here, but um, when I was an undergrad student at Fayetteville, I entered in 1960, and I did go to the one meeting of the campus Young Democrats. It was much, much larger group than the Young Republicans, mm -hmm. but I found that half the, half, there was a big internal power struggle going on in the Young Democrats group, and that um, basically there were two rival factions, the Orville E. Faubus faction versus mm -hmm. the Justice Jim Johnson mm -hmm. faction. And so I actually did exactly what, you know, some of the women you're speaking about did. I gravitated over to the Republican Party because mm -hmm. people don't understand this now, but when Winthrop Rockefeller was governor, uh, it really was a, a progressive group, and that was true mm -hmm. on the Fayetteville campus mm -hmm. the, the, for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, you know, I, I think that's, uh, you know, that what was happening with Republican women, I think, was progressives generally in the 1960s, you know, did, when, when you looked at the alternatives, you know, uh, and, and Winthrop Rockefeller was in so many ways such a very good governor. Mm -hmm. But you might, I, I think that what was happening with the Republican women, that was, if you put that even in a broader historical context, there was a period of time there where Arkansas progressives were Republicans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. people have forgotten that yeah. and all that. Yeah. But and many of those people did later, particularly when Dale Bumpers came mm -hmm. along and, mm -hmm. and other more progressive Democratic leaders, and there mm -hmm. was a migration. But, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I found your talk very interesting. Thank was, you. Uh, and I would also say that um, Miss Annie, for example, oh, and by the way, I don't eat steak, but when Miss Annie cooks you steak, you eat steak. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. So um, anyway, Miss Annie had a very close relationship with the Rockefellers. Um, in fact, their son, she told me their son played with her son down on their farm um, in Marble, Arkansas. She still farms, by the way. Um, many of her farming interests are being um, handled by a Farm Bureau agent in Craighead County. Um, but, they, but, they were, but they were very close. And in fact, when they went to the National Republican Convention, the Rockefellers were adamant that Willa Howard and Annie Zachary would not stay in segregated lodging. They were very clear um, about that. So they were very well regarded. Um, Miss Annie remained friends with them for the better part of 40 years. And she's still, still so well regarded in Marvel, Arkansas, that I believe in 19, uh, 2002, they named a road after her. Right, it's the Annie Zachary Pike Road, and she told me she wanted to be clear um, that she honored both of her husbands. Right. Mm -hmm. This question right here. Uh, regarding the uh, decrease in Republican women after 1972 and 73, uh, after. Rockefeller was no longer governor. Mm -hmm. I do believe by research of my study about human beings to the extent that for black women to be involved in the Democratic Party in the late 1970 was making the white females in the Democratic Party very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Rockefeller was considered an outsider. Yes, he was. 
Yes, he was very, considered very much an outsider. Um, and in terms of these women's activism, what I've also discovered is that if they were involved in one thing, they were involved in 50, 11 other things. Um, because at one point, um, and, and Ms. Hill, you'll appreciate this, at one point, Ms. Zachary was the vice president of the State Home Demonstration Council, which was the segregated, the black um, home demonstration council. And when that organization um, integrated, um, a lot of uh, black home demonstration activity began to fall off. But she's involved in that. She's a lifelong member of the NAACP. And in fact, she just called me the other day to say, well, now you are going to contribute to the Phillips County Teachers Day, right? <laughs> And when Annie asks, you do. Um, and so even at the ripe old age or the ripe young age, as I'd like to say of 85, she's still incredibly involved um, in her community. So it blows my mind to talk to her about all the things that she did, you know, 50 years ago. This is Miss Annie. That's what the present governor calls me. Okay. The previous three before this one called me Miss Annie. All right. But I'm Miss Annie Abrams. Yes, ma'am. And I knew the other Miss Annie. Oh, great. Okay. The things that I think I'm known is that I've never been a slave to any party. Mm -hmm. And that's important, I think, for we as women to mm -hmm. not let anybody make us a slave to them. Mm -hmm. If you go over to the rotunda, and the picture that's hanging there of Winthrop Paul Rockefeller, mm -hmm. it was Democratic women who raised the money. We raised the money mm -hmm. because all of the governor's pictures over there, no taxpayer's money purchased those mm -hmm. for uh, artists to design them, mm -hmm. to, you know, paint them. Mm -hmm. And that particular day that we were dedicating Democratic women for Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. We knew that we would be stigmatized mm -hmm. for being Democratic women mm -hmm. for a Republican mm -hmm. governor. Mm -hmm. That stigma is still here if you want to be a slave to no party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm now being stigmatized publicly, but privately, mm -hmm. Democrats come to my house all the time and ask me to intercede mm -hmm. for them to be appointed mm -hmm. by the present mm -hmm. Republican mm -hmm. governor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what is so important that when you have come through and you've been there and celebrated the 13th Amendment mm -hmm. that freed us according to our Constitution, mm -hmm. we should never be a slave to any party, mm -hmm. any faith, mm -hmm because that's what you are, mm -hmm. a member of the human race. Absolutely. And so when I get to heaven, I'm not gonna be a Republican, mm -hmm. a Amen. Libertarian. Amen. I will be a child of the King of Kings. Yes, ma'am. So I wanna ask you that in your research, and I'm so glad to see you again today, saw you yesterday. Yes, ma'am. That is so important for us in this 21st century now that we are entering into, that everybody here just about has one of those little things. And the history that you are now hearing, I hope that you are recording videos and everything mm -hmm. so that we won't have to depend on a person like you with a PhD to bring us the information that you brought to Dr. Gray. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. will be writing our own histories. Yes, ma'am. And that we will not just have the month of February mm -hmm when we gather mm -hmm. to hear this mm -hmm. information Absolutely. that you can now hear. Absolutely. I teach my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and my great-great-nieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm 85. I don't give a damn about you talking about how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> the line is, we better be recording. I'm not depending on you, Dr. Gray. Mm -hmm. I'm not depending on you. Okay. My house is a museum. Absolutely. And people come there just like they come here. And the Butler Center mm -hmm. asked me, do you have a copy of something? Mm -hmm. I have 1,500 funeral programs. And that's the best history you can have, because folks don't lie on a obituary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
Don't you throw away programs anymore. Save them. Mm -hmm. So that's all I just wanted to say. I'm Miss Annie. Yes, ma'am. I know who you are. <laughs> And Ms. Annie, I would also say that your point is your point is very well taken because when I went to Ms. Annie's house, the other Ms. Annie, down in Marvel, Arkansas, she has an entire room. And I just took my iPad and just went nuts. Just took pictures of everything because that's the information that's not in the archives, that's not in the library. That's the kind of stuff that allows me to write these histories, you know, locating these people and asking them if they want to tell their stories. And sometimes they've been waiting for decades to tell their stories. Sometimes they have relatives who say, ooh, we meant to get around to doing X, Y, and Z. You need to do it today, right now, right now. So I went down there and it was the honor and privilege of my life to be able to spend the day um, with Miss Annie. So whatever she calls and she says, oh, Dr. Branch, I've got so-and-so. Yes, I will drop everything I'm doing and make a beeline down to Marvel. It's, it's just not an issue for me. Um, and to speak to your other point, um, one of the things that drives me to write the histories that I do about Arkansas, as I said at the outset, is the fact that we don't no, um, and it shouldn't be just in these kind of forums that we learn about that kind of history. One of the things that I enjoy doing most in the world is when I teach, and I was telling Juwan this earlier, when I teach my um, African American history or my civil rights classes as I do every year, um, I will tell you about what's going on in a national context, even in a regional context, but I'm also very deliberate about bringing in information from what's happened right in your backyard. And the resources, you know, are available because most of these newspapers, these haven't been digitized as of yet. Um, but things like the Arkansas State Press, the Arkansas Gazette, you know, all of those things have, have been digitized. We have entire databases of African American newspapers. And as I said before, you don't even have to leave your house um, to look at them. So this is what I push my students to do. It's important to know what happened in Tennessee or Mississippi or wherever, or even South Carolina, because that's my home state. But what happened here? What happened here? I can always find something to write about because so much hasn't been done yet. Uh, Professor Branch, I uh, do have a question, but I do want to point out that there are times when you can catch uh, Miss Annie Abrams in a little bit more modest voice. When you call her home, I've never gotten over this. This is the one, unless she's changed it, this was the message you received. Hello, this is Annie Abrams what's left of her to leave a message. <laughs> There's quite a bit left of her. <laughs> Professor Branch, I was wondering, uh, in addition to the woman who you've highlighted, if you've been able to have any other sort of real-time conversations with any of these pioneers, and have you picked up on a sense of what they think has happened to the Republican Party since they were active? Um, with the exception of Ms. Zachary Pike, the rest of them, I believe, have passed. Um, but I know Ms. Um, Annie is not pleased with what has been happening as of late, which is why she always makes it very clear that when she was involved with the Republican Party, it was a progressive and inclusive organization. She has made it very clear to me that that is not what she's seeing happen most recently. Yeah, but the other women, I believe, have passed. And if I'm wrong, please someone let me know. I wanted to ask you, how far along did you go with your history? black women with the Republican Party? Um, this, I just started in 1966, okay. up, to, until, up until about 1974. Now what I would love to do is uncover some information about African American women in the Republican Party in the late 19th, early 20th century, really as far into the 20th century as I can go. The reason why I ask is, my name's Irma Hendricks, okay. I'm a native of the city of Little Rock which I don't think we have many natives left around here in mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. I did run as a Republican mm -hmm. for the uh, Republican Party, for the House of Representatives. Okay. And I also, for many years, have been the parliamentarian for the Republican women. Uh, we need to talk after this. <laughs> we need to and talk. I've been on the board okay. eight we need, years. Okay, we need to talk. <laughs> No worries, I'll come to you. <laughs> I will come to you. Yes. I just wanted to say that the uh, information that you shared about uh, your Miss Annie and the presentation of our Miss Annie inspired me to the point 
that I am encouraged to share this information with my sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students who have very little uh, exposure to their history and especially African-American women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd also like to comment on what I heard in uh, Miss Annie Abrams' voice. Her voice just sends out a message of courage and a mm -hmm. message of honesty and a message of justice. Yes. And it had nothing to do with uh, even though it is wonderful to affiliate with whatever you affiliate with and uh, be recognized for your work as your Miss Annie is still working mm -hmm. and indicates through the conversation from you that she was a very, very hard working person mm -hmm. toward changing things for the better for uh, society. And uh, Miss Annie Abrams is not afraid of anything. And I am mm -hmm. very proud of her, mm -hmm. and she is very inspirational. And I'm liable to do something political after this. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. One more, okay. Um, I, I just want to say I want to piggyback, and, and I don't know about doing anything political, but I definitely feel moved by the things that I've heard uh, uh, just to hear the information that I haven't been intentional in going out and looking at. Um, when you talk about getting stories, when you talk about going and talking to Miss Zachary, um, that is so important. Yes. In 2010, I intentionally went out and did a piece called True Arkansas Treasures. Mm -hmm. Not just females, but there's some males out there. Mm -hmm. And I challenge us today to take our little cell phones and go out there and get those stories. Sit at the feet of the elders, and that's what I heard you say today, that you sat at the feet of the elders, yes. you got that story. Ladies and gentlemen, if we don't do that, it's those, gone. Story, those, those stories, stories are gone. will be buried. Mm -hmm. And she said, be be um, expedient, mm -hmm. uh, urgently go out and get that. And so as I listen to uh, your, 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 your lecture, access, somebody just said inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at the ladies that you presented to us today, mm -hmm. my question is, did everybody have access or were these ladies in a particular category financially and that's why they were looked at mm -hmm. because I don't know that the my family members who maybe were at a lower status mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. have ever been um, identified or um, given accessibility mm -hmm. to be in those particular mm -hmm. Positions and and then two, mm -hmm. our, our mindset. Do we even feel comfortable putting ourselves in that type of situation? If you could speak to that. Please. Sure, um, that's an excellent question. And again, you ha you have to piece these stories together a little bit at a time. And the and the one that I can speak to most strongly um, is Miss Annie. Um, I tend to think that. Miss Annie could do some of what she did in a place like Phillips County um, because she was financially independent. She was a significant landholder. She is you know, very well known down there. As I said before, people worked for her. But what I also think about, more importantly, when I think about these women, is pragmatic politics. Because they are thinking in terms of what's best for entire communities. So when Miss Annie serves on the Farm Bureau Board or whatever, she's not just thinking about what's best for her. She's thinking about um, what's best for smaller farmers, sharecroppers, individuals like that. She's serving on um, commissions like the Commission on Aging. I'm getting this wrong, but it's on aging because she's concerned about these people who are increasingly being pushed off the land due to mechanization. So what are you going to do with the rest of your life if you don't have any resources and you don't have a job? So I think she was very she very consciously used her position to help those who just did not have that kind um, of access. And everything that she did, I believe, is with that in mind. Yeah. Okay. Just a quick question. I was just wondering, uh, in so many 
aspects of a woman's life, uh, so many strings are holding you back, whether it be uh, family life, mm -hmm. children, things of that nature. And uh, as I see right here, I mean, we've got Miss Henry Graham, so we can already see that this is somebody who's a traditionalist mm -hmm. and keeping mm -hmm. the, with the husband's name. Mm -hmm. So what I'm curious about is these women are very influential, very powerful women. How, in a time period where that's just not very mm -hmm. accepted, mm -hmm. did any of these women speak about how many problems they may have had within their own personal life with marriages and things like that? Miss, Miss Annie talked about that a little bit. I mean, Miss Cleve, Mr. Cleve, her first husband, was incredibly supportive. In fact, when she was canvassing from door to door getting people's signatures, she took Mr. Cleve along with her, and he was fairly advanced in age at that point. From what I understand, the second husband wasn't anywhere near um, as supportive. And, and she has talked about some of the difficulties that come along with being a housewife, but also being, I mean, and she defined herself as a housewife, but um, being a housewife and also being involved in these committees and traveling back and forth to DC and traveling back and forth to Little Rock. To Little Rock. So, I mean, she speaks very clearly about the complexities and the nuances and the complications of her life. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is things got complicated and difficult at times, but you know, you get up and you keep it moving, particularly if you are 110% invested in make, creating the best opportunities for everybody. I mean, I think there's a certain part of you there that says, I have to keep moving forward because what I do is important to so many different kinds of people. Um, and particularly in terms of Ms. Annie's activism, she is concerned about rural people. And I think that's another thing that I didn't really speak to. You can read about it in my book. But um, a couple of these women are rural women. They live their entire lives in rural spaces. Ms. Annie has always lived in Marvel, Arkansas. Um, and so it's really important for us to take a look at rural women's stories. And in the process of doing this, I tell my students two things. That for these women, rurality is not ignorance. And dialect is not equal um, intellect. Right? So we're not talking about people necessarily who have a PhD or a lot of formal um, education. We're talking about people who realize a job had to be done. They um, assessed the situation they were in, and they decided that they were the ones to do it with all the complications that came along with it. Thank you.